let's talk about the first law of thermodynamics. The goal is to take all the forms of energy, like work, heat, and total energy, and relate them together. The first law of thermodynamics states that energy can be neither created nor destroyed during a process. It can only change forms. For example, from kinetic to heat, potential to kinetic, and so forth. This means that all the energy can be accounted for during any process. It's really just a different way of saying the conservation of energy. If we have a system where energy enters the system and energy leaves the system, the net change in total energy of that system is equal to the difference between the energy that enters and the energy that leaves. In simple terms, the change in total energy of a system is equal to the total energy entering a system minus the energy leaving the system. We can represent that like this, and it's called energy balance. If we wanted to figure out the energy change of a system, all we need to do is subtract the initial energy from the final energy. We can represent that like this. Keep in mind that energy exists in numerous forms, like internal energy, kinetic energy, potential, and more. We can represent the total energy of a system excluding electric and magnetic energy, using the letter E, and we can show the change in total energy of a system like this. Here, U represents internal energy, Ke represents kinetic energy, and Pe represents potential energy. Note that in cases where the system is stationary, in other words, there is no change in velocity or elevation, then the change in kinetic and potential energy is zero. So you just end up with this. Lastly, we need to talk about mechanisms of energy transfer. There are three ways in which energy transfers to or from a system. Heat, work, and mass flow. These topics were discussed in detail in the previous videos, so if you need a refresh, please check the description. Let's do a quick summary. When there is a heat gain in the system, the energy of the molecules goes up, meaning the internal energy of the system increases. And when there is a heat loss, the energy of the molecules goes down, so the internal energy of the system decreases. Work transfer to a system increases the energy of a system, and work transfer from a system decreases the energy of a system. So things like turbines produce work, while things like compressors consume work. Lastly, we have mass flow. When mass enters the system, the energy of the system increases, and when mass leaves the system, the energy of the system decreases. For example, when oil gets too hot, you can take some out and replace the amount taken with cold oil to reduce the temperature quickly. I got that tip from Gordon Ramsay. We can summarize all of this by writing our equation like this. Note that here, we're saying the quantity that leaves the system and the quantity that enters the system is the same. Of course, if there is no temperature difference, then this is zero. If there is no work transfer, then this is zero. And if there is no mass flow, then this is zero. If we were to write this in a compact form, then we can write it like this. The units would be kilojoules. And if we wanted to write this in rate form, then it would look like this. So we're saying everything per unit time. Think of it as energy transfer that happens per second or minute. And that's equal to the rate of change in the internal system, so kinetic energy change per second, or potential energy change per second, and so forth. The units for this would be kilowatts. Lastly, if we need to express this on a unit mass basis, we can write it like this. The units would be kilojoules per kilogram. Now let's move on to some examples, starting with some easy ones to some hard ones, to see how we can apply what we discussed. Let's take a look at this problem, where we have a house and it's found that during the winter months, it will lose heat at a rate of 60,000 BTU per hour. We can turn on the lights and the appliances, and the heat generated would be 6,000 BTU per hour. We need to figure out the power required to maintain the house at a constant temperature if we use heaters and our answer has to be in kilowatts. So the entire house will be our system. The energy going out would be 60,000 BTU per hour, and the energy coming in will be 6,000 BTU per hour, plus the amount our heater needs to create. Remember that the total energy has to be constant in the house, which means the difference between energy in and energy out must be equal to zero. In other words, energy in must equal the energy out. That means our heater needs to create 54,000 BTU per hour. Now we need this answer in kilowatts, so one kilowatt is equal to 3,412 BTU per hour. We divide our value and we get our answer. So the power rating required for our heater would be 15.83 kilowatts. 
In this problem, we have a room that's at a temperature of 20 degrees Celsius. Then we turn on a few electric devices. We need to figure out the rate of increase of the energy content in the room if there is no heat transfer through the walls. The entire room will be our system. Since there is no heat transfer through the walls, our energy out will be zero. Also note that the temperature given is unnecessary for this question. The energy in would be the addition of all the electrical devices. Now the rate of increase of energy would be equal to the energy in minus the energy out. So the rate of increase in energy is 1650 watts. Let's take a look at this problem where we have a 60 watt fan that circulates air through the ducts. To keep the flow going, the fan needs to raise the pressure of the air by 50 pascals. We need to find the highest possible average flow velocity in the duct. Let's write down what we know. The power of the fan is 60 watts. That's energy going in, and we can write it in joules per second. Remember, 1 watt is 1 joule per second. We also have the pressure since this fan needs to raise the pressure by 50 pascals. That means the pressure at the start of the area versus the end of the area must have a difference of 50 pascals. So that's delta P. Lastly, the flow section has a diameter of 30 centimeters or 0.3 meters. The steps we will take to solve this problem is first, we need to figure out the volume flow rate. Once we have that, we can figure out the velocity by dividing the volume flow rate by the cross-sectional area. So how do we figure out the volume flow rate? For that, we can write our energy equation. Our energy in must equal the energy out. So what energy is going in? We have the power that goes in, and we have the flow work. In other words, flow energy that goes in. And on the other side, we have the flow work that goes out. Don't forget, flow work is pressure times volume, and volume is equal to mass times specific volume. So rate flow work is equal to mass flow rate times pressure times the specific volume. If this is unfamiliar to you, please watch the video on energy forms and mass flow. Now we can bring the workflow to the other side. The specific volume and mass flow is the same throughout the area we're looking at. So we can pull them out and write it like this. Notice when we do this, we get P2 minus P1. So that's the difference in pressure between the two points, which is delta P. If you think back to the previous video, you might remember that mass flow is equal to volume flow divided by specific volume. So if we isolate it for volume flow, we get this. Now you can see that what we have here is volume flow, so let's replace it. Now all we need to do is isolate for the volume and start plugging in our values. We need to use a unity conversion ratio since the units for volume flow needs to be cubic meters per second. Remember that one joule is equal to one pascal cubic meter. Let's solve and we get our volume flow. To figure out the average flow velocity, we need to think back to our mass flow equation. We can get rid of the density, so we're left with just volume flow. Now we can isolate it for the average velocity. The cross-sectional area can be found using this equation. Let's plug in the diameter and solve. Now we can use this value in our equation. Solving gives us the highest possible average flow velocity in the duct. Let's take a look at one last example. We have a gasoline pump that uses 3.8 kilowatts of power, and it creates a pressure difference of 7 kilopascals between the inlet and the outlet of the pump. We need to figure out the maximum possible volume flow rate. Let's write down what we know. The power usage is 3.8 kilowatts, or 3.8 kilojoules per second. The pressure difference is 7 kilopascals, so that's delta P. Now we need to write our energy equation. This question is very similar to the previous one, so we can go through this fairly quickly. So what energy goes in and what energy comes out? We have the power that goes into the motor, flow energy that goes in, and flow energy that goes out. We can isolate the equation to write it like this. Now we can replace mass flow multiplied by specific volume, which is equal to volume flow. Let's isolate for the volume flow. Now we can plug in the values we know. Don't forget to use the unity conversion ratio since we need our answer to be in cubic meters per second. Solving gives us the maximum possible volume flow rate. That should cover the types of problems you will face when it comes to the first law of thermodynamics. I hope this video helped. Thanks for watching and best of luck with your studies.